So the next um, session is uh, a faculty panel on student engagement. And we have uh, three of uh, esteemed faculty members, both from the from graduate education as well as undergraduate education. I'll let them introduce themselves, but uh, the three faculty are Emily Jensen, Jeff Kaufman, and Francis Fernandez. And why don't the three of you go ahead and take it? Do you have um, the ability to share your screen if you're interested? Yep, great, perfect. Thank you, and I don't know that we'll need it. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Jordan Jensen and I'm a lecturer in integrated behavioral health and addiction studies. Uh, I am a member of this esteemed panel and I will also be serving as sort of a facilitator of our discussion today. So as we met to prepare for this panel discussion, we kind of realized none of us are, are necessarily experts on these topics. We're very much uh, experiencing them in lifetime, um, just like everyone else in this room. And so we're hoping to sort of serve as discussion leaders, uh, but would really like to use this space to hear uh, from the group to kind of crowdsource and support each other as we navigate this very uncharted and in many ways unprecedented time uh, in academia. So we will keep the chat going. This is the same structure as um, Mary's presentation, which was a wonderful springboard and has got me thinking about so many things we can talk about here. Um, so feel free to put questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, also don't feel shy about unmuting and asking a question or, or sharing an observation or an opinion as we go along. We'll certainly be eliciting those as we go through, um, sometimes more formally, but if you think of something, uh, don't hesitate to share. Um, so again, my name is Emily. It's nice to meet uh, many of you. I'm joined by Francis uh, Fernandez and Jeff Kaufman, uh, who are both in health services management. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to them to give a more extensive uh, introduction of who they are. And kind of our kickoff discussion topic is very open-ended, but I'm going to ask them to share just broadly some observations they've noted um, in changes in the classroom and in student engagement pre, during, and in this quasi post pandemic world that we're living in now um, to kind of set off our time. So Francis, would you be okay to lead out? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. I am Francis Fernandez. I am the faculty director for the Health Services Management Program. And I also have the pleasure of teaching a couple of courses, um, healthcare delivery systems and inclusion and equity in healthcare management. Um, so I've, I teach in person and in the hybrid model and the online model. So uh, they are all a little bit different. I uh, spent uh, the majority of my career in healthcare, as you can imagine. Um, and um, yeah, just joined the U right before COVID. And um, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> it's been a great learning experience as a professional and as an instructor. So hopefully today we can share some of those experiences and anecdotes and, and learn from each other. Um, Jeff, over to you. Thanks, Francis. Uh, Jeff Kaufman. Um, I probably have, uh, I'm guessing, the distinction of being a faculty member uh, longer than many people on this call. I've been um, on the faculty at the U for 46 years. Uh, started when I was three. And um, thank you for the <laughs> laugh. Um, and I teach both in the graduate program in healthcare administration, and then also on the undergraduate HSM major and also in the ABIS uh, uh, curriculum. And I teach um, the capstone course in HSM along with Dan McGinty. And that's a chance for uh, all the students to pull together a lot of learning over several years and uh, demonstrate that learning both in leadership and in a project that is a real live project in the, in the field, developing a business plan for an organization for either a new program or service or some augmented program or service. And um, it's a lot of fun, really enjoy it. Uh, I, um, I also uh, have taught in the Carlson School as adjunct, et cetera, but uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and really look forward to the conversation. Excellent. Good. So together we have a range of ex uh, 
perspectives and experiences and certainly a lot of years of collective experience. I may not contribute as many as that, but that's all right. Um, we work with graduate students and undergraduate students uh, in our programs. And so I might, as a more formal question, ask the both of you uh, to reflect a little bit on what you've been observing in the last two and a half years. And we're kind of in the midst of it, but is there any arc that you're starting to notice or are there trends that are starting to form? I know in my own classes, I joined the U uh, in September of 20, so right in the midst of, of this pandemic time. And sometimes I feel like each semester feels totally different. I'm not sure that there's a trend or I think is this just this group of students or is this the fatigue of being this far into the pandemic or is this just the current world events that are going on um, in this season? So I'd be curious to hear it. Do you, do you think you see any trends or does it also feel somewhat random to you in terms of engagement? Well, for me, I don't see trends and, and that's the the um the challenging piece of it right so you're preparing for a specific you know term and and for your courses and and you're thinking that you're well prepared and here comes your student cohort and you're like oh, okay the vibe is not there how do i switch things around um you know and it it's for both the in person and the online so it's not like before we say oh, well the online you might not have as much engagement as in person but it is very challenging as an instructor to be out there in front of you know 35 or 45 students however many you have wearing a mask where they can't see you you can't see them you know, in, in really, and, and trying to engage them. You know, there's only so much eye movement I can make and so much hands gestures I can make to get them engaged and know that, that there's a connection. So to me, the challenging piece of it right after we started back with masks was, how do I connect with the students? How do I let them know I'm here for them? You know, um, with the online version, I didn't have to wear my mask, right? I could record videos. So I started recording more videos rather than just, you know, the online instruction so that they could see that human aspect in me, right? I'm here for you. I'm connecting with you. Uh, but for the in-person classroom, that was the challenge that I had. And again, it's been changing semester to semester and you're thinking, well, things are getting better. But then there's another new challenge, right? Um, and we have such diverse students as well that it's difficult to, to gauge or really prepare. So what I'm saying really is that it's okay to feel like you prepared and then you have to switch things around um, because that's really you know, the name of the game. How do we evolve? How do we adapt? And how do we continue to, to keep ourselves engaged so that we can then continue to engage the students? Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, the great comments. Um, I'll kind of break it into pre, during, and, and I'm not even going to call it post yet because right. I just got my fourth booster this morning. <clears throat> um, so I would say pre was, uh, I'm going to use the term a little bit idyllic because I thoroughly enjoy being in the classroom, working with students, seeing that interaction, feeling the vibe, Francis, that you were talking about. And uh, I don't think there's any substitute for it. Um, now, when we get into the pandemic, I can just say it was messy, very messy, um, Francis, as you were talking about. And, and, and we were kind of inventing as we were going along. And I think the important thing um, that I um, tried to, uh, get across to the student groups during that mess was that we're all in this mess together and, and we have to figure this out together. And what works one time may not work the next time. Um, you know, we found that um, at least in one of the classes, we were making um, some, and, we, and Emily, we talked about this uh, in our pre-call, uh, we were making some accommodations for people who literally were out of town or couldn't make it or felt so ill they couldn't be in class or be on the, uh, the synchronous uh, class time. And <clears throat> then some students felt like, oh, gee, you know, it, they're, it, it, we're doing this for a couple of students. You know, why don't we just, uh, I'll go async, I'll go synchronous here and we'll all be on screen and nobody will show up for class during the class period. And that was really messy. So we'd have a classroom of 
of half the students. The other half would be on, uh, on the projection screen. And it was very, very difficult to teach in that sort of kind of in that environment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I won't say we're post yet, but I think we're getting a little better. And I'm very, very hopeful that the fall semester will begin to resemble and I'm not, I'm not going to call anything normal, um, but begin to resemble something that is both um, energizing for students and for faculty. And, uh, you know, it's, it remains to be seen. Um, you know, this fifth variant is, is, a, is a bit of a misguided uh, uh, variant in that it doesn't seem to correspond to vaccinations or a whole, a whole lot of anything. I, I have uh, other colleagues who got their fourth booster and two weeks later, three weeks later, they got the fifth variant and didn't seem to really help them very much. So I think we're still in this. <clears throat> I think we have to, have to still figure our way out of this and uh, we'll, we'll eventually get there, but it's gonna, it's gonna take a little while. Yes. Yeah, some of the language we might use or I've heard used is we're creating a new normal. And it, I think it, it isn't appropriate to say, oh, we're trying to get back to fall of, of 19, right? What that was like, so much has changed in the world. And I think in our classes, when your example about, you know, some students joining via Zoom and some wanting to be in person, it's like when you've opened a can of worms, it is very hard to put the worms back in and say, okay, now we're going exactly back to how it was. Mm -hmm. We may pause to open it up to the, the room to other observations, pain points, uh, things you've observed in your own classes over these past couple years that are leaving you maybe feeling a little stymied as we approach this new normal space. Chat is fine. I'll, I'll dictate those. Or if you want to private message me, you're welcome to do that too. Or please unmute and share. Yeah, I had the experience of offering uh, both Zoom and in person and and trying to manage, yeah, what do you do when no one comes to class? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but on the flip side, it was a tremendous help for students who, you know, would say, hey, I, I can't make class. I could say, well, great, the Zoom will be available. This year, I'm thinking, maybe I'll restrict the Zoom to available for some amount of time, rather than mm -hmm. it being a forever option. Mm -hmm. And Norma, did you just put it out there to say, if you'd like to join via Zoom, you're welcome to, or were there certain criteria or how did, how did I that tried, work? I tried to set a, a, a course long limit uh, of, okay, look, uh, I expect you'll probably all use this once or twice, um, okay. but uh, the, toward the end of the semester, everybody was blowing past there once or twice. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. I think one of the key words you use there is that expectation. And I think that's really important where we're talking about accommodations and I'm not talking about disability accommodations, but like the Zoom accommodation per se, when you have an in-person class. Um, setting that clear expectation is important, right? And uh, it goes back to, to humanizing, you know, the course or, or, or the, the, um, the relationship, if you would, between instructor and student and keeping them engaged, but at the same time, keeping the expectations very clear as to what you need them to complete and that participation mode, like Mary mentioned, you know, it's not raising your hand. It's, you know, how do you evolve uh, that participation so that it works for both the student and the instructor while still meeting those expectations that you have as an instructor? Yeah, hey, just a question. Um, hang on, let me turn my camera on. Um, so uh, Norm's comment made me think about this. Uh, Carl Falls said I'm in ITI. Um, back, uh, Norm, I think you and I talked about this and, and Mark as well, but we were, when we went to Zoom, when, we're, when we had to do Zoom like fall of 20 and spring of 21, um, it was interesting because the, the fall off in student participation was remarkable. First class session, I had 22 students, and by you know 13, 14 weeks later, literally two or three uh, would be joining. And I was recording my classes, and that ended up being part of, I will say honestly, part of the problem, um, because students learned that you know I can take my class whenever now, and uh, uh, and that's obviously what was happening. I lost all the interaction that would normally happen during a class, so mm -hmm. I. So whatever the last completely remote uh, session was, no, it was, it was um, where are we, fall? Maybe spring 
this past spring, we were in the classroom and some student expected me to be recording it, you know, have cameras and recording it. That was there. And they registered with that presumption. And then we had to kind of have an unpleasant conversation is that, no, these are going to be, this is a face-to-face -face class and I'm not recording it. Um, prior to that too, I had to stop recording because I had to, I had to have a mechanism to force people to come to the class when it was held um, mm -hmm. to get the participation aspect back into it plus it's hard to grade on participation which is put as one of the rubrics that's that is measured um when no one's there and i get in discussions with students about you know it turned into a if i'm present i'm participating right right it's like no you have to be asking engaging but anyway i'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit here but i was wondering what other people's experience was with that or what your thoughts on how to, right. I, I felt I was bordering on inflexibility because even people with legitimate reasons that they couldn't attend class, I refused to record it because the vast majority of people didn't respect that. So, right, anyway. and it started from this place of wanting to increase engagement because mm -hmm. I'm gonna meet you where you're at. And then yep. the reverse kind of happened over time. Yeah, mm -hmm. other similar experiences or? Good morning. This is uh, Mariah Dean. I'm a uh, relatively new uh, incoming adjunct professor, um, and I, I appreciate the sentiments of we're not out of this yet, uh, Jeff, um, and I also appreciate the other end of the spectrum of uh, creating the new normal. Um, there, will no, there will not be another 2019 kind of before COVID. Um, I came into the university teaching with the mask on as a first-time instructor for the first three or four or five sessions, if you will. Um, so some were hybrid, some were in-person, some were mass, some were not. Um, but I will say that um, kind of from the teaching staff, it's nice to give ourselves a little bit of relief and pat ourselves on the back because we did navigate it. And then probably uh, even more important, um, our students led us, they, they helped us where they, they saw us stumble and, and try to navigate systems that Gen Xers and baby boomers are not as quick to navigate uh, as the new audiences. So it was, overall, it was a very positive experience. Um, it was a challenge, I think, from, from teaching to say, okay, what else can I be learning, leading, and doing at the same time of trying to coach and mentor a, a group of students through this process? Um, but it was a two-way, um, very beneficial two-way uh, street. Mm -hmm. So some grace present. Yes. That our absolutely. community, how, how uncertain this is. And I think sometimes I often feel like it's our duty to, to host, to create the space, to know, to create this experience for students. And I think that's sometimes why I can feel a little insecure or stressed in the space when I don't really know what I'm up against. And so, yeah, that grace is really appreciated. Yeah, I, I must agree with that. Thank you, Mariah. And thanks, Emily, for that, too. You know, it's, we cannot forget we're humans, too, right? And, and it's okay to grant ourselves some grace and, and do give yourselves a pat in the back because we have been going through these stressors just as our students have been. Uh, we have certain expectations of ourselves as instructors and, and, and maybe, you know, too much. Um, at certain times, especially with what has been going on, um, you know, around the world and and just everywhere, um, humanizing ourselves, I think, is really important. And it goes again with that empathy and in that grace that you need to have, and that humor also can infuse um, some grace in your classroom. Um, um, I like to giggle at myself and I like to present some real life examples of even failures, right? And that's how we learn. And that's a piece of humanizing with, with your students and getting them engaged instead of them seeing you here, you know, they're like, oh, they're a person too, right? Um, and it was really hard again when we had masks, but how did we continue to like, okay, let me show this example, you know? And if you have a co-instructor, play against their or with their, you know, um, own um, 
feedback, I guess, in the classroom. So I, I have the pleasure of teaching one of my courses with a co-instructor and, and we both just engage with each other, engaging with the students. And they're like, oh, this, this is great. This isn't just like, you know, a lecture where we just have to look at the screen and, and whatnot, but, you know, walking around and engaging them in the sense that, hey, this happened to me while I was a director at such, 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 you know, and they're like, oh, wow. And they're, they're that open to share that with us, you know, engaging again with those real life examples. We know it, we do it, but sometimes I guess when, when we were behind that mask, just remember you're still a superhero, even though you're behind a mask. I mean, all these superheroes, most of them at least, they will wear a mask. Well, we did too, guys, we did too, okay? So <laughs> kudos because we stuck around. And we yeah. stuck around with gusto and with love and passion. And that's the one thing that, you know, I encourage you to always remember. You're here because you have passion. And um, yeah, so that's yeah. just my little PSA for today. One, one of the things that I, um, <clears throat> I picked up is a little bit of frustration in terms of student showing, students showing up, whether it's Zoom or in person or whatever, especially for these hybrid blended courses. Um, <clears throat> here's what we're going to do this fall. It might be a little draconian, but it, you might want to consider it. We're going to, as faculty in our course, uh, have only faculty cleared individuals for Zoom. So they have to approach us ahead of time saying, you know, I, I'm going to be out of town. Um, I'm really sick, whatever it is. And we have to actually give them permission. Um, we actually uh, pay a, a second year MHA student to be our TA. So we, we don't get paid for TAs uh, in, in, um, in HSM or ABUS, but we pay our TA and who's a second year. And he this year will keep track of attendance and a whole host of other kind of mechanical things that I, I don't really enjoy, but uh, he'll do a great job at doing all that. Um, and so, you know, coming back to this notion of participation when no one is there, uh, basically what we're saying is in the sessions and our, we're every other week in person, if you're not in person and you don't have a kind of a written uh, or approved absence from one of the faculty, your participation for that day, regardless of whether you're on Zoom or not, is zero. And it's, it's not, you know, I, I don't want to do it. Um, uh, but you know, unfortunately, uh, if we, if we give students an inch, sometimes they'll take a foot I know they're not going to take a mile, but they might take a foot. And so we want to be clear about participation and, but Francis to, to your point, we want to do it in the spirit of you're going to get more out of the class and you're going to have a better experience and you're going to be able to interact not only with faculty, but with your other fellow students. And that is a much more preferred experience than um, I believe than a, than a zoom and, and, and not having that face to face kind of interaction. That's yeah. right. That's right. And, and it's, it's important to emphasize that with the students too, right? Um, and then with that, Jeff, uh, Emily, and the entire group, you know, how do we approach diversity and inclusion, inclusivity with the challenges that we've had, right? So we have some cultural um, differences where Zoom is like, oh, you know, or, you know, in person raising your hand when you're a certain sex or a certain culture. It's really not great. So how do we learn from that to be more approachable, more accessible, more inclusive? Um, quick comment on that. <clears throat> and that is, um, we tried it last year and it actually worked. Um, we actually planted some questions with students and uh, especially with members of minority groups or ethnicities or whatever. And that plant and their agreement to, to raise the question or to talk about something seemed to give uh, permission, if you will, in quotes, to everybody else that fit that sort of demographic, whatever it was. So, I mean, that's one way to think about it is to actually make it work by planting uh, some comments or questions with students and saying, hey, you know, brownie points. Um, and and I, I think the other one, and uh, we talked about this again in our pre-meeting, um, for the Muslim population, they have prayer time. And our, um, 
one of our courses takes place during a period of time where they would normally have prayer time. And so we actually take a prayer break um, in that class. Other students that don't participate in that are fine. They can you know, do whatever they want to do. But uh, the other students can go someplace and and uh, and practice their religious belief and, and that and it fits in and it works. And so but that was a conversation with the class and, you know, they brought it up and we said, oh, yeah, we can make that work. So it's I, I think it's just a conversation with your students and about what it is they need and how would, how do we accommodate to do that? Again, this is it's not I don't call it the new normal. It's just new and um, and we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Jeff, can you clarify a bit the example you're giving about like planting questions? Like, what does that look like? Are you talking to specific students ahead of time? Yes. Or yeah. So um, we'll we'll notice that there may be a member, and I'm and I'm just I'm just throwing this out in a in a broad brush, a member of a religious group or an ethnicity or male, female, or whatever that doesn't seem to participate that much. And you you kind of see that over time. Um, and then uh, we just have a conversation about how comfortable are you in talking in class? Is there something that we can help you with? Um, would you be willing if we sort of planted a question or had you make a comment about something, would you willing be willing to do that as a part of the class? And I would say 95% of the time they say yes, because it's this, this it's just a, the notion of giving permission when they don't understand what that permission is all about or what it means. And uh, I, especially, you know, in the, uh, the capstone group, these people are all graduating seniors and, uh, and, and they're going to go out in the real world, um, which is, you know, we're preparing them for that. They're preparing themselves for that. And uh, I think they get it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's fun for me personally to watch somebody who has been relatively quiet in class, give them that enablement to do something in class or to ask a question or to provide an example for something and they don't really, most of them don't really shrink back to the way they were prior to that interaction. And uh, they become much more confident. They're, um, they participate more in class. And I think they feel good about themselves. Right. And you're going to them privately too. This Correct. isn't calling Correct. out or putting someone on the spot. Correct. Mm -hmm. But that individualized connection. Sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can we, let's hang with this topic for a little while longer. We have had a question about some more logistical pieces and structure, and I think we could get back there, but staying more with this idea of inclusivity and engagement and recognizing that engagement isn't a one size fits all. And our students are coming to our classes from all different backgrounds, states in the life course, you know, ability, all these different, different factors. Mm -hmm. Can we open that up to the group too? Have you seen any specific students struggling um, with different elements of online education versus in person or during the pandemic or any other kind of pain points you've been experiencing in classes? As we wait for some folks to chime in, perhaps, you know, just throwing out there, evolving, adapting, again, you know, use your multimodal, um, you know, approach, you know, versus one size fits all, one size doesn't fit all, right? So I've had some students that may feel more uh, prepared and, and more confident doing a presentation of, you know, a cultura video, you know, to present their discussion, for example, rather than writing it out. Uh, with discussions, um, you know, feel free to chime in, you know, and that re-engages the student and kind of re-energizes them like, oh, professor is here, right? So let's go ahead and answer some more. Uh, and I have experienced that versus when you don't engage in those discussions, it's just like, man, okay, I'm just doing it and, and that's all. But the multimodal, um, I started using that this past year and you just, you know, putting some cultura um, assignments in there, not just the first one that says, introduce yourself, you know, tell us about yourself, blah, blah, but doing some of those discussions via cultura, really, really amazing. And I echo what Jeff was saying at the beginning of the course, when you see somebody who might be a little bit more shy, and I see their progression throughout the course, and at the end, I'm just blown away by the confidence that now they have. You know, we're here not just to instruct, but to mentor. And like Jeff said, prepare them for the real world. Um, and 
you, throw whatever you have, you know, out there and see what catches. Um, and, and that's the thing, you know, we cannot just, you know, go by, okay, well, this is the template. This is what I follow. Well, see what works and what doesn't, you know, feel free to experiment that way. Like Jeff was saying and throwing out, you know, those, those uh, questions, if you would, because that's how we learn to be a better mentor, a better instructor um, and, and a better engager, if you would. And you have something you want to say to us. Uh, Francis, one of the tools that I that I that we use quite a bit, and it really does kind of break things down, um, is a Jamboard. And uh, students just let fly, and because it's anonymous, and then we talk about some of the things that come up on the Jamboard, and then occasionally there'll be something that'll that's, that'll be on the board. And I go, gee, I'm not sure what that means. Would the student who put that on there help explain to the group what that is? And usually they'll come forward and talk about it. So um, that's just one tool that we use to really get participation going and get the conversation going. And I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, mention that the use of groups in your classes can be really helpful for engagement. I teach exclusively online and have for several years. And the one class I teach has a lot of group work in it, but um, it's, I think it's really, I've noticed no difference really in the class during COVID because the students are really engaged with one another and you know which ultimately you know i suppose i want them to be engaged with me too but they feel more connected and they feel like they belong when they're in a group and just the other thing too about different learning styles and communication styles it's always kind of fascinating to me that some students who are you know very vocal in the discussions vocal typing in the discussions um might not be quite as engaged in the group as a leader, but then there are some students that aren't as engaged in the discussions, forum discussions that are take a leadership role. So I think, you know, trying to just bring in some different kind of learning strategies is helpful. So, um, and students are great with groups. They know all the technology, they know all the different tools to use that we don't even have access to at the university. So mm -hmm. they, they do great with that. So it's another way to kind of get them engaged and bring them in. Yeah. Thanks for that, Anne. I think one of the things that I tried this past term also with my hybrid course, we did have groups and have presentations. Um, and I would have a couple of students saying, well, I can't make it in because I have X, Y, Z, or it was during Ramadan. And we have, you know, I respect, you know, their religious observances, but I said, you know what, why don't you record a video? That way we can play that in the classroom with your colleagues as they're presenting. And it was like a game changer for them. They're like, I can do that. I'm like, absolutely. That way you get your points, your group gets the points and everybody's happy. And it was great. It was a really, really great exercise to do so. Yes. yes. Sometimes that constraint drives creativity. It's like we have access to a lot more tools just because we've had to, to access them and had to create them. Mm -hmm. Someone asked about a Jamboard. I think Jeff is just giving that as an example of, of what some, something you can use in the class, not something that we're creating for this specific talk. Mm -hmm. I had a note about groups. One way that I've used groups really effectively is for some reading accountability. So one of my courses, I teach in a flipped format. And so you know I'm expecting students to do a fair amount of reading preparation before they come to class. These are graduate students who are working and have families and, and you know how it goes. If you really did all the reading assigned in grad school, you'd never be done reading. And so with some of this accountability is necessary. And I have specific prompts related to the reading for each week, and they go, come together in small groups. And I find there's some social pressure, I think, in that small group that's safe enough mm -hmm. that they feel like I don't want to you know, show my group members that I didn't prepare. But if I had a wild week and I wasn't fully prepared, there is some of that grace here. And I found that to be pretty effective, I think, to increase that engagement of that outside preparation too. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, and we have a link to Jamboard if you want to use that tool. Yeah, and as we go along, if you have tools or ideas or resources that you just want to drop into the chat, please feel free to do that as we go. Good. You know, I wanted to bring up the subject of mental health and mental health resources that are available here at the U. There is a myriad of resources that I encourage you guys to, you know, add on to your syllabi. Um, engage the students in the conversations that are difficult, you know, but during that first meeting, that first, uh, you know, class, just let them know these are resources that are out there. 
if you want to meet after class or if you have a question about them, I'll be happy to guide you. And I cannot tell you how many times students came before or after class and said, thank you. You know, I had X, Y situation. And then they tell you the situation, which maybe you don't want to hear, but just lend the ear, right? It's okay. You're there as their sounding board. And that's what they need. You know, they need somebody who will listen and say, okay, this is the resource that I can guide you to. And then you send them that way. And that has also been a great thing. Um, you know, we have a lot of great resources. Um, so use them, encourage your students to, to go. And like Mary mentioned, I don't think any of us have that magic formula for work-life balance. So um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Francis. I think that's a good segue into one of the other topics we discussed in our pre-meeting that we wanted to bring to this group is a trend that some of us have, have observed is kind of this, this trend towards more casual interactions or expectations with our students. Certainly, you know, having class in the home via Zoom, I think brought some of that, some of that humanness, which has been wonderful. And I, I think there have been some really positive outcomes because of that. But there's a tension, I think, also with professionalism. Um, for We're preparing students for the professional world. Uh, one example I shared with this group is I had a student this summer who emailed me the night before the first meeting of a class to say, Hey, Emily. Hey, Emily. That's how it started. I went really hard at a bachelor party this weekend and I'm sunburnt to a crisp. I'm not going to be in class tomorrow. <laughs> and I think, would you send that to a boss? You know, I, I don't, you could just say I'm not feeling well, you know, illness is an excused absence. Why did you feel the need to, to tell me this? And it's hard to know how to respond, right? Should I write back and say, mm -hmm. hey, check that language. This is not very professional. Or should I feel like, oh, I'm glad that the student feels comfortable sharing this with me. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, we're curious if others of you have observed similar trends and how do we navigate them in a way that makes space for humanists, that makes this work more accessible, but also holds the line with professionalism. And is that a line or is it a really squiggly gray area? Emily, great, uh, great point. Um, what we have done, again, I, this, there's no magic here necessarily, is that from the from the first day we say these classes are not a social media format and and this is a classroom just like you attended class in high school or pre-covid or whatever and your point about professionalism and and entering the professional world of work is a very very important one and so um while i'm okay with professor jeff uh it doesn't <laughs> I say, yeah, uh, Kaufman is my dad's name, but not mine. Um, I, I'll go with first name, it's fine. <clears throat> but I do think um, we also ask students when their group is presenting, um, not to show up in jeans and a t-shirt that has some sort of whatever on it. Mm -hmm. um, we say, look professional. And, and we, we continue to talk about that as a component of leadership. Uh, because it's, uh, you know, you're out there and you're in front of everybody else and people are going to take their cues from you. And so to the extent to which you want to have um, that respect in the workplace, you have to provide the, the milieu, the, you know, the format for, for that quasi formality. Um, I think the workplace is changing tremendously. It's not going to go back to what it was but there's still a hierarchy in any organization and that needs to be respected. Mm -hmm. So this is an explicit instruction you would give to students about professional attire. Correct. Yes, and I like your point in the beginning too about this isn't social media. I think more and more we're living so much of our lives in an online way. And when we bring online class into that, again, I think that line gets less, mm -hmm. less distinct than physically at home, physically at work, physically at school. They may have social media up on a window and their class on the next window and that code shifting, you know, may not be as, as I don't know, discreet. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. And, and it's, it's a rude awakening for some students, but again, it's that line, right? I don't think it's so much a squiggling line. I think some students might want to push it into a squiggly line, but there is that line of professionalism and the mentoring that we are trying to accomplish with our students in, in guiding them and preparing them again for that real world scenario, right? You're not gonna do a presentation to the C-suite with you know, uh, the cafeteria background out there and, oh, sorry, my, my roommate is here. You know, and I've, I've had to stop some presentations and say, 
can you go to a more quieter place, you know, because it is distracting. Um, it's not professional and, you know, oh, I'm sorry, professor. And, but again, these are things you tell them ahead of time, right? But it's like, okay, let's go back. Um, but there is a sense of extra family, familiarity. I'm sorry, I can't say the word very well, but um, yeah, that sometimes you need to kind of push back a little bit. And I think the the, the social media um, aspect of it, Jeff, like you mentioned, has kind of like opened that door and it's up to us to kind of say, no, it's, it's not a swinging door. Right now you're at the university and this is the expectation. Uh, it may sound harsh, but it's not really. It's really preparing them to be better citizens of tomorrow. Right. Yeah, Michelle says in the chat that laying these expectations explicitly in the beginning is probably a really good idea. Mm -hmm. And I that's one observation I've had in my my learning curve here at the U is I, I think I was relying on a lot of assumptions about mm -hmm. what I thought students, graduate students, how they would comport themselves, maybe based on how I did or my colleagues did when I was in grad school not so long ago. Right. And I think things have shifted. And I found that having to be more explicit in my syllabus and on the first day of class has helped with a lot of this culture stuff that I was just relying on some assumptions for. From the room, have others noticed trends this way, some more casual language or what we might call lack of professionalism in your courses? Yes, and Ben, can I, I'll read this out loud in the chat agrees with Michelle because some of our concepts of what professionalism is, right, is steeped in marginalizing practices, right, and I think that's what are, what is this institution, right, and how, it, what is the culture of our institution, and it, is it something that we need to be upholding, or are there places where it needs to be more flexible and needs to be more accessible, you know, in what ways are patriarchy and white supremacy and, and privilege dominant in academia, and in the workplace too. And I think it's tricky because we wanna prepare students for this workplace, but the workplace is also changing in really important ways too. And that's a big one, I guess, but any observations like this or thoughts about how we navigate this gray space? I have a funny one. And I think Francis and Emily, if you just dye your hair gray, you're gonna be in much better shape. <laughs> Well, I don't want to show my grace. That's why I dye it brown. I understand. <laughs> I, I color my hair so I get more respect. <laughs> there is something interesting. And we spoke about this in our meeting too, Jeff. I shared the, the anecdote about the student and the, the sunburn in class and some other very explicit, you know, things that students have shared with me about why they're not in class. And you thought, well, maybe it's gender and maybe it's age. Maybe that's why students are more likely to share that kind of thing with me than maybe they would be with you. And that's an interesting topic. And I think as faculty, you know, we all hold different social positions, you know, and that interfaces with the social positions that our students have. So when I say squiggly line, I guess, I mean, it needs to be dynamic and it looks different for all of us. Yeah, yeah. They'll, and you know, with that, um, again, the cultural diversity plays a role as well, right? So. It's just, you know, making sure that, that that line doesn't break or doesn't bend too much so that you lose that engagement or you lose that, um, that boundary setting, right? Um, and it's hard, especially when you don't understand where that expectation of that boundary should be for that particular student or student group, right? Um, and it's something like, we continue to learn about and continue to evolve. And with that, you know, every semester, every term for me is a little bit different. We talked about it at the beginning of, of the session. You know, how do we adapt to those changes so that we're a little bit more prepared for the next term and then we're thrown with, with new scenarios, right? But at least we're learning from that past one and say, okay, I need to tweak this because this kind of didn't work, you know, and it's okay. You know, you try it if it works great and if it you know doesn't go back. To the drawing board, you know, and, and do that piece. Um, but engage with discussions with your faculty directors, engage with discussions with your ATD folks. My gosh, they know their craft, you know, and they can throw some great ideas at you for that creativity piece that Emily mentioned at the beginning too. Um, you know, there, there is no magic formula 
but there is a learning that we can all learn from each other and don't be afraid to share um, because I, I'm constantly learning uh, from my team and, and my cohorts and, and, you know, it's just adapting. This may sound a little crazy, but I think you can also create an expectation by the way you carry yourselves as faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, both Dan and I in our capstone course, whether we're in class or whether we're um, asynchronous on Zoom, we dress professionally uh, for, for class and for the Zoom. Um, I recall one time last semester that I went to a lecture uh, in another part of the university and the faculty individual uh, had um, kind of holy jeans and a, and a hoodie. And I, I actually went up to the, and it was a great lecture. It was fantastic. But I went up to the faculty person afterwards and I, and I just shared my observation of my quote initial impression, which really wasn't all that positive. And I was, I didn't, my expectations for the lecture were colored by the fact that he wasn't dressed at least somewhat professionally. And uh, he, he, I don't know if it sunk in or not, but I, but I do think we create expectations by the way we carry ourselves or the way we dress as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just like to jump in and, and offer that, uh, you know, I, I work at AWS and I'm continually frustrated that the work culture there is we give away hoodies and expect people to be in t-shirts. So I think there's it become a really wide range in what it means to dress professionally. Not necessarily helped by the fact that you see C level people showing up in jeans and mm -hmm. casual. So I don't know how to communicate to you know our my students what what that means dressing professionally. They're, they're, I can't point to someone and say do that. It really does vary by industry norm because mm -hmm. I was jumping on my mute button too, going listen. You know, Steve Jobs wrecked it. Well, I'm not going to say wrecked it because I like it, but, you know, all <laughs> of IT should be wearing black turtlenecks and tight jeans, I guess, because that was kind of his thing. But, you know, coming after him, it's Elon Musk and Mark, whatever his name is from Facebook. They define success in the IT industry. And they're consistent in how, how they present themselves, which is almost counterculture. So, um it's no surprise that those of us, I'm going to generalize, but in ITI, I mean, I'm in, I'm in sales. I meet with C-level execs and this is how I'm going to dress. Okay. I'm going to have a Tommy Bahama button up and jeans. Yeah. And that's it. I have, I've worn nothing but jeans for the last, I've been doing this for 20 years, probably the last 15 years. Yeah. Every day is jeans. So I, 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 I get, I get your point, Jeff. Um, and I guess I'm belaboring it. It's just a fun topic for some of us to talk about because it is very different. It, it is. Than, than I think it varies by industry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your, your point about it is, is very well taken. I don't think in healthcare, just, you know, Francis and I coming from that persuasion, I don't think we're there yet. Um, and, uh, and so it really depends on the setting. I think you make a very, very valid point. Yeah. For sure, for sure. But then again, that's the evolution of adaptability. But like Jeff said, you know, and, and Carl and Norm, thank you so much for all that input as well. It really depends on the industry, right? So like if I'm an anthropology major, you know, I'm probably gonna dress up like Indiana Jones, right? But um, in, in health services, we're more into that business side of it. So we're gonna try to be a little bit more formal ITI. I, it's polos and turtlenecks and we get it, you know, um, but it, the industries are changing, you know, times are changing. But again, you know, all things free, uh, discussion on professionalism is coming up. So stay tuned for that one. Um, but yeah, I think um, to that point is, you know, students showing up to do a presentation in a cutoff shirt or, you know, that's where you want to draw that line and say, hey, you know, the professional attire we expect for the classroom for our presentation would be this, this and that, you know, so. Francis, I think you look really great in that Indiana fedora, quite frankly. Uh, you know what? I do look good with hats, I must say. <laughs> right, right. So a couple of notes in the comments about this discussion that I think are worth raising um, about building space. So Ben says, sometimes it's just a question of what are you trying to accomplish as an instructor, which I think can feel like a moving target to a lot of us, but sometimes a hoodie and jeans helps to build that space for students, absolutely. 
uh, timely discussion about what is professionalism. It does, it feels like a moving target. And I think as faculty, there is that, pr that pressure to, to carry over from the earlier presentation to feel like we have to know and we have to be leading into the space and sort of carrying this liaison role between the professional world and our students and the academic space. And so I just, yeah, wanna name that that can feel like a lot of pressure. Um, and then perhaps can we focus on professionalism and their work ethic instead too? Is that something that is maybe, maybe more consistent than dress, for instance? And what does that look like? That might be a good question too for the room. Mm -hmm. Are there standards for work ethic that we can, can focus on? I think Tony Scott just mentioned there also, understanding your audience. I think that's a great starting point. You know, understanding your audience will then, you know, um, lend itself to how you're going to present yourself and the expectations that you have with that group as well. And thank you. Excellent point. Gender and ethnicity matters in this discussion. Absolutely. Um, and I think we would need an extra hour to talk about that. Uh, but indeed, um, you know, and, and I'll call it out as, as a female minority, um, it, it has been hard to be in the workplace and it has been hard to portray, you know, the confidence needed for the next leaders of tomorrow to say, you can do this, you can effect change. And my expectation is that they will affect change so that, you know, we can, you know, move forward. But it is a big, big um, um, area where we can learn from and, and try to understand and, and be empathetic about, um, you know, it's, there's, again, there's no right or wrong way to approach things. Uh, aside from being respectful and learning from your students, uh, you know, experience that with our Muslim students. And um, it's, it's great when you can empathize and you can show that human aspect of yourself that we don't know at all uh, and we're learning from them. And, and I would say, you know, please, you know, if I'm mispronouncing your name or mispronouncing your holiday, please correct me, you know, blah, blah. Um, but it is very important to understand your audience and be as, as human as possible and as empathetic as possible um, so that they can then connect with you. And I think that's what we're talking about here. How do we engage them? How do we make that connection so that we can continue to have them, you know, have fun, you know, in, in the classroom, whether it's online or in person, keeping them engaged and enthusiastic about what they're learning and what they're going to do in the future. And, and that's the piece, you know, as long as we're learning from them, um, we can teach them better. I think I'm learning from this conversation as well. And it's probably time for me to go back and look at some of my old school habits and, and think about changing some of those. Amen. I also echo the sentiment. This is Mariah again. I'm reading uh, some of the posts in the chat. Um, and it's interesting to, you know, when you think about your background and where you come from and where we are today. Um, just a real quick snippet. I'm a, uh, a child of military parents, so a military brat. Uh, any branch of military, you wear a uniform. Um, so in my thinking, in my acting, uh, professional dress is always appropriate. However, with the dialogue in the chat, thinking about, hey, there are some cultural things uh, to reinforce uh, professionalism and work ethic. Um, and again, from the standpoint of a young group of, of individuals who um, show up in many different forums and say that we're great, we're smart, we can do this as well, and who cares about how we dress? Um, so I, I think I, I appreciate the dialogue in the chat and it is challenging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're short on time. We have just a little bit left. Um, can I open it up to the room? Other thoughts, anecdotes? This has been a really engaging conversation about very timely issues. And I, I think sometimes I can feel kind of isolated in this role as a, as a faculty member. And it, it's really awesome to lean on this community and no, no, we're not alone. Any other, any other thoughts? Wonderful. 
Well, Michelle's comment is very kind. You did say ton of respect and offer faculty. Thank you um, for all you do. CCAPS cannot achieve its mission and vision without you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, ben has something. Think about movement in the classroom. As someone who has worked with athletes sitting in one place can be awful for their experience. Mm -hmm. Right, or for neurodiversity or for students who, you know, this model of sit in a class and listen to a lecture for an hour, you know, really privileges a certain learning type. And, and as a student who's maybe, you know, come from a certain cultural background to, to be able to engage well with that. So to, to think creatively and how to access all different learning types and all different backgrounds is a big ask I think for us but a really worthwhile one and it's very helpful to to crowdsource and get some of those ideas from all of you Emily quick question for everybody because um, this athlete thing is a, is an interesting one I think I I have um, division one athletes in most of my classes for whatever reason um, almost all of them have an assigned someone tutor or something that kind of help them navigate the university and some of the sports are the sports first and school is second. Mm -hmm. And some of the sports are school is first and sports are second, just depending upon, you know, is it football, basketball, hockey, or is it some other sport that, that isn't a huge revenue generator for the university? Um, and I, it, I'm curious as to uh, listen to other people that are, that are on right now about how they handle that. Um, I've had student athletes who, who have performed incredibly I've had student athletes who really coast and just do the minimal amount to, to get a passing grade so they can stay eligible. Um, and uh, I'll just use the name because I think he would have allowed me to do it. I had Gable Stevenson in a couple of classes, uh, Gable being the big Olympic heavyweight wrestling champion and just a really wonderful human being. Um, and, uh, and he and I have had a numbers of conversations where he's fallen behind and I say, Hey, Gable, come on, pick it up. You can do this. And, um, and we have those conversations and, and he comes through because for him, um, I think he's mature enough to understand that this athletic career is going to be a fleeting one. Um, you know, at, at best, he might maybe have five to 10 years doing whatever he's going to do after college sports. And, uh, and he wants, he wants a major that he can take into something after all of that. But I'm curious as to what others feel about having student athletes in their class and how that works. I think one of the things that I want to say, not just for student athletes, but as we wrap up, um, you know, with, with time is um, provide feedback. I think that's the one thing to continue the engagement of your students, um, you know, whether they're doing a great job or whether they need some help, you know, um, make sure that when you're grading those assignments, you are providing some sort of feedback, especially with the online um, courses. They don't see you. Um, they want to feel that connection and that engagement uh, piece. So that's really, really important. So um, that goes along with what Jeff is asking, what Ben put up on the on the chat um, as well. Um, and that I think is one of the better things. You know, whether it's verbal in person or online, make sure that you're doing that. We are about out of time, and I don't know. I, I I don't know if we would have space to revisit these kinds of conversations, but it may be nice to have them more frequently. Just as we navigate all the change that's happening, I think it can feel like it gets away from us a little bit, and and I certainly feel more I don't know inspired and and prepared going into fall after this conversation. So maybe if we can do this again another time soon, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Emily, Francis, and Jeff. Really appreciate you leading this discussion.